Today we're going to look at a very nice approach to evaluating the very famous Gaussian integral. And that's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. And this approach I found in the book Inside Interesting Integrals. Okay, so let's see how we're going to do this. The trick that we'll use here is to involve two related functions. So let's first define a function f of x to be equal to, well, it's going to be the integral from 0 to x of e to the minus t squared dt. But it's not exactly that integral. It's this integral squared. OK, great. But now let's observe that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is in fact equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus t squared dt quantity squared. But now notice that our function up here is being integrated from minus infinity to infinity, whereas right here we have an integral from 0 to infinity. That being said, this is an even function, so the integral from minus infinity to infinity is exactly twice the integral from 0 to infinity. So that means that I can put a 1 half here if I change this lower bound of integration to minus infinity. But from here what we can do is solve for the integral, if you will. So observe that now we'll have our integral minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. I'm changing the variable of integration here from t back to x. It's like a little bit not ideal because we've got a limit of x on the left hand side and a kind of unrelated integral with respect to x on the other side of the equation, but I think it's okay. And then observe that what are we doing here? We're squaring a half. So that squaring a half will turn into a 4 over here. But then we're also going to have to take a square root. So that means we really have 2. And then the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. And then we're taking the square root of that. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good, but we're not just going to use this function f of x. We're also going to use a function g of x, and it's going to be defined as the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x squared times 1 plus t squared all over 1 plus t squared dt. So that's definitely a crazy looking function, but this function, well, along with the function f of x are really key to this approach. Okay, so now what we're going to do is take the derivative of both of these functions. So let's first take f prime. Observe that in order to take the derivative of f, we have to use both the chain rule because we're taking a function and squaring it as well as the fundamental, th the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So in the end, that's going to give us something like this. We'll have two and then e to the minus x squared and then the integral from zero to x of e to the minus t squared dt. So of course, two times that integral is from the power rule. This two is coming down. And then the e to the minus x squared is from the integral of the inside function. Okay, nice. But now let's take g prime as well. So observe that g prime of x, well, notice that x is not a variable of integration inside of the function g. So we simply have to use the chain rule on that numerator. But now observe that using the chain rule on that numerator will bring a 1 minus t squared or a 1 plus t squared out. That'll cancel the 1 plus t squared in the denominator, leaving us with the integral from 0 to 1 
of minus two times x times e to the minus x squared times one plus t squared dt. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good, but I'm gonna do a little bit of manipulation here. So let's look at this stuff that I'm overlining in this peach color and observe that we can rewrite this as e to the minus x squared times e to the minus x times t both squared. So now looking at that, we can factor the e to the minus x squared out. We can also factor this x out, but we won't factor that x out. We'll actually com combine it with the dt term. So that'll leave us with minus two e to the minus x squared. And now we have the integral from zero to one of e to the minus xt all squared times x dt. Okay, great. But now that motivates a change of variables for our integration, in other words, a substitution. And so the substitution that we'll use here will be u equals x times t, but now that's gonna make du equal to x dt. But observe that here we've got our u term, this x times t, and then this is simply our du term, this x dt. And then, well, what about the bounds of integration? Well, observe that when t is zero, u is also zero, but when t is one, uh, u is equal to x. So that's gonna give us, well, what? Minus two times e to the minus x squared times the integral from zero to x of e e to the minus u squared du. Okay, great. But now let's look closely at what we have. We have f prime is two e to the minus x squared, and then we've got this integral from zero to x of e to the minus t squared. And then we also have this g prime, which is suspiciously very similar. Notice it's minus two e to the minus x squared, and then the same integral, but with a different integration variable, but that's okay because that's just a dummy variable of integration. But observe that if we put these two things together, we'll see that f prime of x plus g prime of x cancel each other out to zero. But, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that the derivative with respect to x of f of x plus g of x is equal to zero by the linearity of the derivative. But if you take the derivative of something and you end up with zero, that means that the something, in this case, f of x plus g of x, is equal to a constant. But what constant? Well, it's really any value of the function. So we might as well take a value of the function that's easy to calculate. Perhaps we'll take the value at zero. So we need f of zero, but looking over here, f of zero is the integral from zero to zero of something squared, but the integral from zero to zero is zero. So f of zero doesn't contribute anything. And then g of zero, we'll observe that plugging x equals zero into g will give us the integral from zero to one of one over one plus t squared. So this is gonna be equal to, like I said, g of zero, but I'll write that as the integral from zero to one of dt over one plus t squared. But that's an easy integral to calculate as pi over four. Okay, so now let's maybe build a summary of what we've got so far, and then we'll finish off the last couple of steps. So to evaluate our integral, we were using the following two accessory functions, or we explored those accessory functions so far. And we determined that the sum of these functions was a constant, and we calculated that constant to be pi over four. We also did a quick calculation showing our goal integral was in fact equal to two times the square root of the limit as x goes to infinity of this function f of x here. So 
at this point, what I'm going to do is, well, one of a mathematician's favorite tricks, and that is add the number zero, but we'll add the number zero in the form of g of x minus g of x. So here we'll have two, and then we have the square root of the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x plus g of x minus g of x, but I'm actually gonna split that into a separate limit. And we can do that because all of these limits exist. Okay, so that'll be minus the limit as x goes to infinity of, like I said, g of x. Great. And just so that we can really see it, this g of x here and this g of x here are really like the version of zero that we have added. Okay, but now let's observe that for all real numbers x, we know that f of x plus g of x was pi over four. So that means I can take this f of x plus g of x here and replace it with this number pi over four. So let's do that. So that'll leave us with two times the square root of the limit as x goes to infinity of pi over four. But the limit of a constant is simply equal to that constant. So that leaves us with pi over four. But then what's the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x? Well, let's look over here at g of x and observe that if we bring that limit inside of the integral, well, let's go ahead and write that down we'll have the integral from zero to one of the limit as x goes to infinity. We have e to the minus x squared times one plus t squared all over one plus t squared dt. But now let's observe that if we take x to infinity, this term right here, this e to the minus x squared times one plus t squared trends off towards zero. So that means this whole bit over here, this limit of g of x function actually turns out to be zero as well. So that means we're left with two times the square root of pi over four. Well, pretty clearly this two and this four that's inside of both the square root and the denominator will cancel, leaving us with the square root of pi. And that's a good place to stop.